Your set, boss. Priscilla. An inspiring movie about drag conquering the world. Could have it again, please, Terence. Priscilla. An inspiring film about drag conquering the world. It came from a crazy idea one night after Mardi Gras. It's four o'clock in the morning, Oxford Street is just pumping, and there's some trashy drag queen stumbling up the street. Big plume of feathers break off, wind picks it up, rolls down Oxford Street, and there you had a feather boa that was a tumbleweed from a Sergio Leone Western. And that singular moment, I got it. Drag queens in the outback. Their frocks and feathers hit the battle scars of decades of repression, fear, and violence. Oh, stop it! I was standing in a park and I'm arrested! <laughs> Their journey would inspire a modern-day fable. At the heart of the film was a simple question. What were we so afraid of? The boundaries of Australian masculinity were kind of stretched or, or thrown out the window, or there was a light shone on what it was to be a, a man. Priscilla, who'd have thought you'd take us so far? Every now and then, a movie comes up that kind of uh, changes the whole trajectory of your career and your work. And Priscilla was one of those. I never dreamt I could do it. I was frightened to do it. But in the doing of it, I overcame my fear. So did Australia. We changed. We grew. We learned. It was about time. So, let's begin, shall we? Sydney in the 1970s. Life in the suburbs had never been better. Each driveway throbbed with a V8 and a man in a body shirt. It was a culture built on family and ruled by the great Australian male. If this was the life you wanted, it was paradise. If you dreamed of something different, it was prison. There was no room to be gay here. Well, uh, if I was talking to a queer, it might be pretty queer, my attitude towards them, you know? I don't like them at all. I reckon they're rats, they're really kicked to death. Well, I haven't had never had much to do with it, you know? <laughs> to be homosexual was not only to be an outcast, it was also a crime. Sex between men had a penalty of 14 years and a whipping, which was greater than the penalty for rape. But in a world that punished difference, everyone in this film dared to deviate. I was kind of raised in that perfect Australian upper middle class world. I mean, it was white picket fence personified. Divorce happened pretty popularly then in the 70s. Divorce came at exactly the right time for me. The white picket fence, fence fell down when I was about 13. The curtain lifted then. I started to question everything. The year was 1979 and uh, I was 21 and I was a man uh, for a short time, and just as soon as that word was, you are a man, I thought, well, well, not for long. I think I'll become a woman very, very soon. And six months later, I was frocking up in Sydney and having an absolute ball. Cindy Pastel would become the inspiration behind Hugo Weaving's character in Priscilla, Mitzi. The actor and his muse arrived in Sydney around the same time. Well, I came out as a sort of West Country English boy at age 16, thinking I was really cool. 
And I was quite struck by a sort of aggressive, masculine framework. And I thought, oh, in order to be a bloke here, or to be a man in Australia, you have, to, you have to be a certain sort of rough and ready character who, who doesn't talk about certain things and jokes his way through, through stuff. <laughs> There were a lot of comments at school, you know, kids would say, well, you're just a poofter and this, that and the other, and you'd, you'd think, wow, it's, you wouldn't want to be gay, would you? You know, growing up, wow, that's, oh, I reckon it'd be pretty, pretty tough. A desert holiday, let's pack the drag away. You Guy Pearce's character, Felicia, would be one of the many young queens lured by the bright lights beyond suburbia. Just like Priscilla's creator, Stefan Elliott. I went to Sydney Grammar School, which is snack bang in the middle of Oxford Street, basically. At the end of that road, there was this weird twinkling, a little bit of glitter in this kind of weird world that was kind of winking at me. The inner city was a beacon for the refugees of the suburbs, a flame that drew exotic creatures into the light. They girls had been bewitching audiences since the early 60s. A theater restaurant with some unusual meat on the menu. <laughs> Leading ladies like Carlotta would provide the model for my character in Priscilla, Bernadette. I think, and I think you think, I look more like a woman than a man. Like girls probably, simply because it was a place where men cross-dressed as women, it had a reputation. Early on, people, might, gay people might have gone there, but very soon it just became a hen's night out place. I mean, there were so, so many more interesting places to go to. By the mid-70s, a new kind of drag was emerging in clandestine venues along Oxford Street. It was the hub of a growing gay underworld and a rite of initiation for new arrivals on the scene. Polish your pally glide and fasten your fox trucks. Two flights up the stairs. I remember being taken when I was quite young, I guess still in school, by a friend to Capriccio's for the first time. Um, that you ascended these quite steep stairs with a lot of anxiety because what you were doing was sort of illegal. It's something daring, the continent. And there was this some sort of strange deal about do you know what you're getting into and all of that. And then, of course, you entered this strange world. The music was really loud, but that's what I noticed most. So you are kind of swept along. They have you seen the karaoke? And the reaction to the shows by the audience was ecstatic. And I somehow recognised that this was my tribe and this was, we own this kind of show. In the early days, it was a very underground community which was oppressed and the people were a little bit scared. And the drag queens seemed to be like the natural leaders. Hi, we're the cast of Capri shows in Oxford Street, and you're just about to see the finale of our first show. I think we better take a five minute call, girl. All right, oh, thank you. Oh, oh. No. In macho Australia, the bravest men wore dresses. Priscilla would make them national icons. For a budding young queen just landed in Sydney, it was mesmerizing. It was just the gayest, most wonderful thing to grow up with. No wonder I wanted to become like them, but not so much 
the glamorous part, but the, the, the bit of the wonky kind of it. As the 80s arrived, drag dared to break out from its secret venues onto the street and into public bars. It was a new wave of punk drag. Crazier, wonkier. People were experimenting with lots of different things in the 80s. It was an era that just opened doors for anything, just to give it a go. Cindy Pastel's star was rising when she moved in with the girl who worked the door at Patches nightclub, Karen Cahill. I moved in and it was a freezing cold room and I, um, I just couldn't stand it and I just went and jumped in the side of the bed and hopped into bed with her. And um, it was so warm and so gorgeous and it must have got really cold one night and I must have cuddled her. And, um, well, there you go, the drag queen was on with the door bitch and uh, they had a kid. I take all this off at the end of the night and I go home and um, I've got a baby and a wife. I think people would be pretty amazed to hear that. Do you live a straight life? Oh, I don't know if you call it straight, but it's, um, it's kind of straight. Sydney was a gay bubble. It was King's Cross moved to Oxford Street and then subsequently to Newtown and Erskineville area, a gay bubble. But we didn't travel west of King Street. It wasn't the end of the world, but you could see it from there. Stephen Elliott was working on films by day and propping up the bar of the Albury Hotel by night. The Albury was the king of drag venues and the queen in residence was Cindy Pastel. There was Cindy Pastel on a bar, not just as a, as a woman, he dressed as the most completely stuffed up, retarded piece of kabuki science fiction, you know, sniff and ammo and, you know, like, it, and, you know, forget about the lip syncing, sync, that went out the window in seconds. And what planet are we all on? The idea for a movie about drag queens began to germinate. But when Stefan dared to venture outside the Sydney bubble, he came face to face with the ugly genesis of Priscilla. With my first partner in a restaurant, two young 20-year-old boys on our own, and suddenly this voice says, well... What have we got here, eh? When he spun around and there was this kind of team of football players and obviously one of their mothers, who was a battle axe is the best way to describe her. And she started. Could I please have a stop? No! You can't have. You can't have nothing. We've got nothing here for people like you. Nothing. The humiliation of sitting so far out of your comfort zone, so far away from Oxford Street, so far away from those bars, I didn't know whether that big ugly wall of suburbia had been put up to stop us from getting out or them from getting in. I think that moment of the humiliation of just being attacked by this woman and not being able to fight back. I've never felt so humiliated. It was the story hook Stefan needed. He wrote a draft script for Priscilla in a matter of days. If anyone could penetrate the dark heart of Australia, it was the drag queens with their frocks of armor and those dagger tongues. Stefan came to see me at the Aubrey and came down to the dress room and I'd finished the show. So he was like, can we have a conversation about this movie I'm making? I said, no, I don't, not now. I've just finished the show and I'm going out. And so you know, here's my address, come around and see me tomorrow and you know, we'll talk about it then. Anyway, so I forgot he was coming and I answered the door with my son in my hands, my little baby son feeding him muesli and, and he's like, Who's the kid? And I was like, That's, this is my kid, this is my son Adam. And he said, well, look, I'm just going to stop it right here now and I'm going to go and rewrite the script. Mr. Belrose? Yes? Congratulations. It's a boy. One of the great things about the film is that Steph sort of hit on a particular point in gay subculture in Sydney, a particular time where 
drag had evolved into an art form in its own right uh, in a really kind of interesting way. And Priscilla sort of surfed that wave. At the Aubrey, Stefan also met designer Tim Chappell, an escapee from fashion school who found his calling making drag costumes. It was a natural fit. Well, there's this great Polari phrase called mock de croc. And mock de croc means to be able to make something from nothing. And mock de croc is the way most drag is made. It's about being able to put it together from an air freshener, a bit of tinsel, and a bit of aluminium foil, and sticking together with a hot glue gun, or some, well, Cindy Pastel sometimes did it with stapler. Priscilla was mock de croc. He was the true definition of mock de croc. When Stefan first started speaking about Priscilla, I thought, why not? And at that point, it had been turned down for funding from every film body in Australia. Uh, my favourite one was when it came back stamped, deeply shallow. It was completely racist. It was completely sexist. It was completely chauvinistic. I mean, we were going to dress an Aboriginal up in drag. I mean, no. That wasn't going to happen. We we're going to have, uh, you know, an Asian stripper firing ping pong balls out of certain bodily parts. We couldn't do that. But, you know, and even the script I'd first given to the Mardi Gras organisation because we needed to borrow costumes, they said, no way in the world, this is, this is, this is horrible. In what were sensitive times, to some it seemed a juvenile film, making light of a serious world. Let's not forget, while Stefan was pitching Priscilla, gay sex was still illegal in some parts of Australia. And the stigma of the 70s, when homosexuality was branded a mental illness, still lingered. The main options those days were either going to a psychiatrist or undergoing aversion therapy. Aversion therapy, they would uh, attach some uh, electrical equipment to you, they'd show you images of naked men, and if you responded, you'd get a shock. The worst cases, of course, were the lobotomies, they, uh, where they would actually lobotomize you, cut part of your brain. This would seriously stop you from basically being a functioning human being, though. What do we want? What do we want for No wonder so many gay people in the 70s lived undercover in the backroom bars and drag clubs. For those who chose to walk the streets in protest, there were serious risks. You could lose your job, you could lose your house, you could lose your friends, your family could erupt on you, um, and um, worse things could happen. In fact, than that, there could be violence. In San Francisco, the counterculture was exploring new ways to protest, and it looked like fun. There was something going on in America at the time. They were having um, parades, gay parades, and I thought, well, why don't we have a, a party, you know, a street party? Sydney's first Mardi Gras began with a ragtag group of 100 or so following a truck down Oxford Street. The mood at the time was joyous, and we were hoping, really hoping, that we could get the people out of the bars and into the street. That was sort of like the big slogan at the time, out of the bars, into the street. One guy passed me. He came out of patches and uh, he came out and he said, I'm out now and I'm going all the way. Flouting the marcher's permit, police tried to shut down the party. But defiantly, the parade continued onwards. When we got to the Alamein fountain, it was very dark there. There were police all around. We were cornered and the police were coming in, and I mean in numbers, many, many numbers. Paddy wagons, we were lambs to the slaughter. Once there was like a physical confrontation in the middle of King's Cross in the middle of the night with police who had a very bad reputation for their conduct, I mean, everyone started getting involved. It's very unfortunate that these sort of things happen. I think it's unfortunate uh, that a couple of policemen had to receive hospital attention. Fifty-three people were arrested that night, but something had shifted. 
the gay underground had surfaced and found new allies in the street. Mardi Gras had been born, and there would be no stopping it now. Mardi Gras was conceived by me as a celebration. But there's no way on earth it, it couldn't be political. And it, it, it has to be politics in drag. I had a dream. Against a mountain of naysayers, Stefan Elliott, an executive producer, Rebel Penfold Russell, sought to raise $2 million for Priscilla. Very difficult sell, you know, two drag queens and a transsexual on a road movie across Australia by someone you've never heard of. The more no's we got, the more obstacles that got put in front of us, the, the higher the toy went on the shelf and the more determined we were to actually make it. The whole idea of three drag queens traveling to Ayers Rock in a bus, I uh, read that bit and I thought, they end up, they choked themselves by the time they got to Redford. You know, if you're so bored shitless and sitting on a bus, for God's sake, no, this, this'll never work. It was funny and ingenious. The phrase at the time was fish out of water. I, I saw it more as this collision between forces that did not understand each other. Well, we did it. So what now? I think I want to go home. By 1993, they'd begged, borrowed, and emptied their own pockets just enough to make the film. Time to find a cast. First up, Mitzi. Steph and I were doing frauds, his first film, and, and he said, look, my next film is I, you know, three drag queens going out uh, in, into the desert. And I said, oh, I said, Steph, I'll do anything in it. Hugo came first because I had a good relationship with Hugo. Hugo trusted me and, you know, there was nothing as more wonderful as our first day of costume trials where we put Hugo in a dress in a hotel room in Melbourne and he just ran up and down the corridor screaming. And he was like a kid in a, in, in a toy shop and I just knew Hugo was fine. Next came Felicia. One of the agents at the agency said, mm, we don't know if you should do this, you know, don't know if it would be a good move. And I said, I'm not even having this conversation. I really, really want to do it. Life's never boring, is it? And I don't know why I got given the role, but I know that part of it is because I think Stefan liked the idea of taking somebody that was, had been a neighbours and <laughs> putting them in a dress, you know. And I think part of what it was for Guy, it was, a, it was a chance to shed that skin. He knew that he would absolutely take Mike from Neighbours out and kill him. Lastly, Bernadette which proved a little tricky. There was this wealth of realistic actors that we went through. It went from Tim Curry to Colin Firth to Clive James to Rupert Everett. Stefan himself went into a kind of casting delirium where one moment he wanted William Shatner to play Bernadette. Then there was Tony Curtis who went, I am your Bernadette. But of course, the new Mrs. Curtis went, oh, I don't think so. Stamp had been on the cards for quite some time and we just thought he'd never do it. it wouldn't, we don't have a hope in hell and, you know, the planets aligned. He had decided that week to give up acting. His career had been reduced to playing American villains in big budget movies and he'd given in and he walked into his agent and said, I'm, I'm done, uh, let's call it off. And his agent said, well, OK, how about this? And just put it in front of him. Wait a minute, sunshine. Let me put you straight on that. I'll tell you how it happened, right? I was given this script to read about like drag queens in Australia and I thought this is the last thing in the world I want to be doing. And then a few weeks later, my friend Caroline Bliss came round and while we were talking, the phone rang and it was my agent and she said, oh darling, what did you think of that sort of drag queen script we sent you? And I said, well, you know, it was a bit sort of predictable, wasn't it? And she said, oh, we all rather liked it. And I said, did you? 
and suddenly my friend Caroline said, just say yes and hang up. What are you talking about? And she said, love, your fear of this project is out of all proportion to what possibly could happen. Just keep saying yes, and maybe it will go away. So I was bullied into taking the role, but I would only do it on one condition. Tell me about you. Can't complain. Bill Hunter must be my boyfriend. Spent 30 years wandering around the world. Bill loved Terence. He admired him so much. And for them to actually have the opportunity of working together again um, and reacquainting it with each other uh, was one of, the, I think, the big reasons why he wanted to do Priscilla. And with that, the wheels on the Priscilla bus were rolling. I didn't know it then. But we needn't have gone to the outback to find the heart of homophobia. Sydney's homosexual community has been promised top-level help in tackling what it describes as a growing wave of hate bashings. A report out today shows a high percentage of gays and lesbians are victims of gang attacks, less than half of which are reported to the police. It used to be uh, the term, the term poofter bashing. Yeah. That was basically a, a gang sport of the... Yeah, the early boys. 80s. Go out. The early 80s. You go out and, what are we going to do tonight? We go and roll some poofters. In the late 80s, rumours flew like the winds around the cliffs of Bondi Beach. The coastal track alongside Marks Park was a popular gay beat and the place to prove yourself for Sydney homophobes. One of the things that I saw happening quite clearly was that because you had young people going, well, society hates gays, the cops hate gays, it's OK for us to do whatever, and we're never going to even get into trouble for it. Sometimes it was a bit of a rite of initiation, you know, to go poof to bashing. John Russell was preparing to leave Bondi and build a house on the family farm. It was the weekend that he was going to be moving up to the farm. Dad, yeah, was, coming, to... Dad was coming down on the Saturday, Saturday right. morning yeah. to pick him up. Right. And uh, Thursday night he went out. Anyway, it, was, it wasn't uncommon for him not to come home. You know, it depends how your night went, I suppose, as whether or not you come home or not. Christ, how are we going to find it? No, let's see. Come down here further. Let's come down here. This is the block where John was going to build a house. We were going to fence it off so that it takes in the waterfront and all that. I was at work the next day and two police officers walked in and said, look, you know, we think we've found your brother. So they drove me over to Glebe Coroner's Court where I identified him. This is where he is. You know, when the old man turned up at the door, he said, well, good day, mate, how you going? I said, you better come inside, mate, I've got something to tell you. And uh, the nightmare transpired from there. John Allen Russell. It's been a while. Please dismiss John's death as a suicide or accident. It's how a lot of gay hate murders were brushed under the carpet in those days. He was actually found holding someone's hair in his hand, which was not his own hair. So you had clear evidence it was a murder. There's no other reason why he would have been holding that hair. And you know, back in 1989, police just overlooked that. And in fact, you know, that crucial piece of DNA evidence even went missing. Tragic. There was a certain amount of evidence there, but anything of any DNA value was, was not present. They'd lost that, they'd lost all that, so. Mm. When I flew into Australia to start the movie, I looked down and I saw those wonderful cliffs of Bondi Beach, completely unaware of, like, their terrible secret. At the time, I was obviously totally preoccupied with, like, how I was going to play Bernadette, you know. Like, a woman born into a man's body. My task as an actor was no less than to become a woman, and... <laughs> I had no clue where to begin. He did struggle with it, I reckon, generally. I remember that he wouldn't do the tuck. 
interesting, considering he was the one who'd had the operation. But I think, you know, you've got to leave your sexuality at the door when you've got to leave all sorts of things at the door when you play any kind of role, really. And it's your masculinity that on some level that's got to be left at the door when you take on roles like this. And I reckon there was a little part of Terence that hung on to that. Stamp didn't know who he wanted to be and he had this image in his head of being half Brooke Shields and half Jacqueline Bissett. And he brought Jacqueline along for a couple of meetings and was studying her and watching her and, you know, you know, he's no Jacqueline Bissett, I'll say that. And you're no Cecil B. DeMille, darling. But you did have at least one good idea. You realised I needed a tranny trainer. Enter Robin Lee. I thought, Terence Stamp, I remember him when I was young and I love him. So uh, that was very exciting for me, just the fact that I was going to meet him, let alone work with him. And I thought, what'll I wear? He had to learn mannerisms, like when we sat together, I'd say, you pick up a glass, and he'd pick up a glass, he was holding it like that. And I said, no. I said, this is how you do it. Then pick you up. Just little things, and then I'd go like that with my hair. And he just used to sit there. Like, we'd be talking, but he'd just watch everything I did. And he'd say, that's very fascinating. The one thing we had to do was ultimately the litmus test, which is to get them out there, take them out onto Oxford Street, and in character, let them see the experience, let them go through what drag feels like. So we spent a full night getting them all done, getting them all ready, and took the three of them out to a nightclub in Sydney with Bill Hunter as bodyguard. So we were all made up and in a frock. It was like a multicoloured sequin, sort of, and I had a blonde wig. And uh, Guy and Terence and I were all going to meet at my house. So I went home in my full regalia, got back. My little uh, boy, who was four at the time, screamed and ran away from me and, and and, and I said, oh, it's all right, darling, it's OK. He said, I said, it's daddy. He said, he said, take the wig off, take the wig off. I, I took my wig off and he said, oh, put it on again, put it on again. So, so I put it back on. But um, Terence and Guy arrived and then I think we walked from there, Billy chaperoning us all the way, got to DCM and proceeded to get very, very drunk. One of the things that was actually really fun about it was that I wasn't recognised. I was in disguise. Aside from the fact that I was in drag, I was actually in disguise, and so I was like, wow, this is incredibly liberating. Guy was very hands flapping about, running about, having a great time, and getting adored by everybody, and letting them touch his abs. Terrence was so ladylike, he was like sitting on the mezzanine like he was at a chic restaurant. Just watching everything. And I said, where's you go? And Terence went. And I looked down and there was you go passed out under the table. And me, like in the movie, going, come on, darling, come on, it's time to go now. And I remember other drag queens looking at us and kind of going, who are these girls? I seen these girls before. My mascara was running when they took me down the steps at the end, and uh, my heel was broken, and my wig was askew, and I was a very sick boy and ended up vomiting out of Steph's car on the way home. So it was a fabulous night. We had a ball, but sadly, like Cinderella, I awoke the next morning to find nothing had changed. I was still terrified. First day of shoot, he was frightened and we knew it, so we made a decision right there and then. No mirrors, no, he couldn't look at the, the dailies, he couldn't look at any footage. Let's just keep Bernadette away from him. And for two or three weeks, he had this basically this shadow hanging over him of what it, what it was he was doing. And he was frightened. He couldn't get the voice right. He couldn't, he couldn't find himself. It's true. I was fine on the gay golden mile of Oxford Street, 
But once we left the safety of Sydney, it was a different story. Lex Watson, I think, went to do a debate about, about gay rights in uh, Mount Isa. Tonight from Mount Isa, Monday conference debates homosexual rights and wrongs. And that was incredibly brave to go to like a very masculine and very outback and very socially conservative place. Yes. Mate, why are you a puff? What? Why are you a puff? Oh, God. Why don't you call yourself a straight out puffter and pervert? And why are perverts allowed to run the street and rape and murder and kill little babies like you? Oh. The boot is on the other foot, my friend. We don't go around murdering kids. We don't go around murdering heterosexuals. But the reverse is done to us. They're promoting doctorisation. And he likes to reach. Hey. There it is. That he was attacked and had, you know, shit thrown on him and stuff was, you know, one of those iconic moments, I guess, in, um, you know, the conflict between a sort of a visible urban gay scene and um, the great vastness of, of Australia. Oh, Felicia, where the fuck are we? The mining town of Broken Hill was the first place we filmed outside of Sydney. We were to perform on a bar in front of extras who were real life local miners. I was consumed with fear. Waiting in the wings, looking like some drag abomination of a cabbage patch doll, I found myself wondering, what am I doing here? I'm a matinee idol, I'm a serious actor. I'm the best dressed man in Britain. What am I doing here? And then, action! Pure adrenaline. One take. I'd broken the bounds. After that, I was flying. Yeah! And afterwards, it was a different person. And I said, are you all right, Tell? Thinking, I'm, you know, my career's over. And he said, I just crossed the barrier. He said, I'm not frightened anymore. I'm not frightened of anything. If we'd been in Sydney, I would have marched in the parade. One of the icons of Mardi Gras in the early 90s was Vanessa Wagner. Part of a new wave of drag queens with a political edge and a taste for anarchy, known, defrocked, as Tobin Saunders. In 1991, for the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, I can remember thinking, I'm sick of all these parade entrants that are obeying and marching up the street. Let's get a bunch of doled out drag queens with shopping trolleys smashing into the audience and causing mayhem. Thank God for the new wig. <laughs> <laughs> so we were going to do like a gorilla entry um, and I was just so sick I, and I was like, oh, this is a really bad flu. And my friends were like, no, you can do it, you can do it. We can get up and do it. And shoving speed up my nostrils and trying to get me out. And I was just the crookest I'd ever been. It felt like someone had stuck a needle in me and sucked the life out of me. Bang, bang. Shut me down, bang, bang, I hit the ground. Bang, bang, that awful sound. Bang, bang, my baby shot me down. When HIV came to Australia, it was seen as a gay disease simply because the first statistics were of amongst gay men. Prejudice emerged. I mean, there were terrible newspaper reports. People who you thought might be your friends turned against you. And so the, the whole movement which we had felt was gradually occurring towards liberating homosexual life stopped. It took a terrible step backwards.
AIDS would be the ultimate ordeal the gay community would live and die through. There's people dealing with an enormous amount of fear and grief. Um, and there's, there's people sick, uh, sick in ways that no one's ever seen before. I just photographed my friends. And perhaps that's the power of my photographs of AIDS, is that people let me into their lives, really, uh, and into the dying process. And uh, I think that they felt that they were making some contribution by allowing their story to be told. Each of the thousands of candles carried in Sydney is a lost lover or friend, brother, son, daughter. Ken Madison, Doug Mason Harper, Bruce Ron Osborne, Andrew George Robertson. Robertson. With their sequin armour and verbal weaponry, it was the drag queens who rallied the troops. I can't. You can you be, will you? I'll meet you there. The drag queens seem to be like the natural leaders. And I think that's partly because when you become a drag queen, you have an alter ego, you have another self, which is different from your normal self. It's like you can be everything that your normal self isn't. I often used to say, you know, I'm here now to, you know, the Andrew sisters went to war to entertain the troops. Well, I didn't go to war to entertain the troops. I stayed here to entertain my brothers and sisters that have lost other brothers and sisters due to AIDS. I just felt like every time we'd lose somebody, a part of them would come in me, a part of them to give me strength to be this, this performing puppet for them. There was a real fabulous fatalistic kind of frenzy, if you like, if I could alliterate. And I can remember thinking, OK, well, fuck that. If I'm going to die, I might as well die on a colourful street. It was defiant exultation that had brought the gay community this far and would now burn more brightly than ever. We had this city that was just on fire. So much was happening in Sydney. It was breaking almost every rule in the book. I mean, Sydney suddenly got sick of being frightened and it erupted. From agony to ecstasy, it was the wildest of times. There was just this sense of happiness and rebellion and, and it, it just all came together. And once I stepped my foot into that world, then everything changed. I'm pretty sure the general straight community were like, wow, those people really know how to throw a shit hot party and have a good time. We want a piece of that. At last, the tribes have been united in a spirit of pure abandon. The same spirit would inspire the most iconic image in Priscilla. The thing about making a film is that a single image has to linger in your imagination. It starts quite early on, and it's the one that keeps you going, that keeps you aspiring to realise the film. Stefan liked to name sections of the script, and this one was called The Spirit of Ecstasy. And he was inspired by the ornaments on the front of the Rolls Royce. You know, the lady, he's flapping. And I was like, oh, that's great. And I was like, oh, let's build the dress into sails. Tim went away and came back with four foot wings. I went completely ballistic and said, come on, this is this moment. Tim's mum worked for, for Target or something and uh, she got 20% discount. Imagine. So Tim went and bought every piece of lame he could find. And I think it added up to being about 180 metres of lame. I had one day to get it ready to go on the bus. And so I just spent the next 24 hours sewing, cutting, sewing, cutting, sewing, cutting. The next morning we get to set, it's beautiful dawn, 
It's like a magical picture. The bus is ready. I lay the lame out along the road and attach it to the bus. And there's no wind at all. And the bus starts off and it's just dragging along the ground. Flapping, flappy, flapping. It was very sad. It was a very sad moment. And then the stunt supervisor said to me, Tim, it's really dangerous for the performer. You're going to have to go over there and cut it off. So I went over to the bus and I picked up the lame with my scissors. And as I picked the scissors to the lame, this huge gust of air picks the whole thing out of my arms and she's off and away and Priscilla is born. It's the one image everyone remembers, a banner of change driven into the Australian psyche on an old bus. <laughs> Decades later, its brilliance hasn't faded. After years of neglect, institutions which had once ostracized the gay world are now treating it with dignity. Fifteen years on, John Russell's case was reopened by police and a coronial inquest began. You can't just write someone off and say, well, they, they're not a legitimate victim. They, uh, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They lived a reckless lifestyle. Because they live that way, they don't deserve the same amount of care and the same amount of discernment from an investigating authority. I think. I don't think that's right. I think we've got to do the best we can for those families because they're always left wondering. It, it's a wound that will never heal for them. The inquest found that John Russell had been thrown from the cliffs and that a motive of gay hate had been ignored or missed in up to 80 other murders since the 70s. I would like to know who did it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> who, who it was and, yeah. and, and justice be done. Whether it was one, five or ten. Uh, every, yeah. I suppose that's all every, everybody ever wants is, is justice. They did matter, they were important. We are prepared to learn from this. Attitudes will change. Their death is not in vain. <laughs> Back on Oxford Street, an unlikely group of marchers joined the Mardi Gras parade. You know, at the beginning of the parade route, you had the police lined up at one corner, and at the exact adjacent corner was the 1978ers who'd been bashed by the police. And the police are standing there, the 78ers are there. I'm just standing there watching this going, wow. And as the parade took off, and the 1978ers led the parade, because it was 20 years, the police all stood there and actually saluted. And people had tears running down their faces. The cops were crying. The 78ers were crying. It was just like this magic moment of, you know, social healing. I went along to the Mogar each year and watched that become a celebration of the city. And Somehow contained within Priscilla is that whole journey of, of, of gay culture within a short space of time from being where, you know, if you were gay and, and an activist, you, you were likely to be hauled off the streets and thrown behind bars to, to a, a, a real celebration um, where you've got police floats and, and politicians marching. You know, so uh, it was a huge transformation within a short space of time and kind of reverberated beyond Sydney in a big way and with this film kind of out to the world. So it did, it did catch a fantastic wave. This flow. Yeah. We surfed that wave over the oceans to a little town called Cannes in the south of France. Dad, Cindy Pastel who'd inspired Hugo's character came too, with his son Adam, to face the music of fame and their own stories. We had to rush to get ready to get to the opening. 
and uh, suddenly we're there and we're sitting there and, and I've got Adam sitting next to me. And, and then comes the most, my favourite scene in Priscilla's when, um, when Hugo uh, is pretending to be straight. Sorry about last night. I don't always uh, dress up in women's clothes. I mean, you know, don't get the wrong idea. I'm... If you ask me what the film is really about, it's about a gay man coming out to his son and has spent his entire life fighting this moment. You know what I am, don't you? And I knew this was coming up and I was thinking, oh my God, I've never had to tell Adam anything like this before. And here it is, this is our life. Here we are watching our life being, and I thought, oh my God. And I just remember reaching down and grabbing his little hand and, and holding it because it was like, uh, too late, I had, couldn't tell him. It was, here it was on a big screen in front of us. And I remember it so distinctly that he grabbed my hand and he squeezed it a little bit tighter as if, and it was a feeling of like, it's okay, Dad, everything's all right. No words had to be said, nothing had to be explained. It was just life and we were just living it. The heart of the film caught with that can crowd. That story of a father and a son, that brought total silence to them. They weren't laughing. Film ended, house lights went up, then they ripped up the seats. That was the real surprise. They went ballistic. And they just kept clapping and roaring and clapping and roaring and roaring. And I said, when does this end? I mean, it was stunned and I did. I got very emotional and then Stamp said, let's go, let's quit whilst we're ahead. And I only, you know, we'd only had 10 minutes of standing ovation when we could have gone on to 20 and apparently that's the gauge you can. But you know, you never see your life changing in a moment your life changed. My life changed at that moment. I was doing the man from Snowy River and they wouldn't give me the time out to go to Cannes. So I had Stefan and Hugo and Terence bringing me drunk after the screening in Cannes and it had gone off and everyone had loved it, you know, and I'm on set going, great, it's great, guys. I created the character of Bernadette by just, like, thinking about the most beautiful women I'd ever seen and wonderful women I'd gone out with, you know? So she was really going to be absolutely fabulous, and that was my whole motivation. I believed I was creating this glamorous creature. Of course, Stefan never allowed me to see the rushes, and I didn't understand why until the first night in Cannes, and the movie opened, and I looked like this old dog. And I thought, shit, he's really taken me to the cleaners, that bastard, you know. But give him his due, it really worked, because what was so touching was the character believing she was this God's gift to women, and she was this old dog. After the film, the musical. As Priscilla hit the stage of the West End and Broadway, went to Italy, Brazil, Recently, it opened in Korea, where apparently no one is gay. But having conquered Australia, the Trojan horse of drag continues to take on the world. toughest movie I've ever done and the most fun. You know, I'd made up my mind really early on if I wanted to make that pro-gay film which dealt with all the issues, AIDS and equality, and no one would have seen that film. I made a film about three clowns that asked you as an audience to laugh at them. Anybody could laugh at them. Nana could laugh at them.
The joy of the film was it took you in on one level, it turned you in the middle of the film, and by the end of it, you were laughing with them. Stefan, you stole fire from the heavens. You added the drag queen to the pantheon of Australian icons. And I'm so pleased I was part of it. I hope another hit pops into your head. In the meanwhile, farewell, love. In a toilet. <laughs> At the trough. Um, no, where did we, where did we meet? Patches? Oh, I can't remember. I think it was Patches in the dressing room at Patches. Patches was booming in those days. And um, I remember you coming there and doing solitaire, if I remember it correctly. And I thought it was one of the best things I've ever seen. And then when we clicked, I said to you, you wouldn't happen to be a Leo, would you? I am. And that was it. We were inseparable. And we kind of have been for many years, but we haven't seen each other for many years. And, and then, now we live next door to each other. Now we live other. next door to each other. <laughs> and it's, it's heaven. It's heaven. And you've just turned 70. I have indeed. And you still remember who I am? I do. I haven't got Alzheimer's yet. Not yet. Or dementia. No. no. Well, we'll probably get them together and we, 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 we'll be fine. We, we won't know what's going you've on. You've got to worry the day you come out and I go, who are you? Then you've got to worry. Well, I'll probably just say, who are you? Mm. It'll be fine. We'll get on fine. Come on, dear. Have another coffee. Go on. 